Welcome. My name is Kyle Hamilton. Uh, we're going to start the event here. Thank you for coming. Um, so my name is Kyle Hamilton. I'm on staff at Anselm House. We're a center for Christianity at the University of Minnesota. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event on the prosperity paradox, how innovation can lift nations out of poverty, featuring Ifosa Ojomo from Harvard Business School. Tonight's event is sponsored by Anselm House, Global, the Global Business Student Association, and the Interdisciplinary Perspectives on International Development student groups. So I just would like to thank all of our student groups who made this happen, and others as well who got the word out, like Truth in Business, and uh, Net Impact, and other groups as well. So thank you for being here. Glad you're here. Anselm House aims to create events that are relevant, thought-provoking, and engaging to people of all backgrounds and perspectives. So you can help us with that by taking the evaluation form that you received on your way in. And if you haven't received one, you can raise your hand. One of our ushers can pass one to you. Um, but if you please take some time just to fill that out, that will really help us uh, with two things. One, it will help us evaluate the event, and it provides us with an opportunity to make sure that we're really uh, providing excellent events for you and improving them for the future. But also, if you're interested in receiving email updates about events like this one, we can inform you about that. Uh, those that complete the evaluation card will also be uh, entered into a drawing to receive a copy of Ifoso Jomo's book, The Prosperity Paradox. So that's uh, an opportunity there for you as well. Um, but you can also just uh, fill out the card, leave your email off it if you don't want to, and we'll collect it and just receive your feedback as well. After the conversation, um, please fill out any remaining sections of your card, and the ushers will collect it at the, at the end of the, at the session. OK, so now for our program. The Prosperity Paradox. What if, instead of trying to fix the visible signs of poverty, we focused on creating lost, lasting prosperity? What might happen if we flipped the emphasis to innovation and market-based solutions rather than conventional development-based solutions? Can market-creating innovations produce culture change, reduce corruption, and facilitate an environment for the development of strong, accountable institutions in emerging markets? To help us think through that complex and challenging question, set of questions, we have Ifosa Ojomo here with us, who is the Senior Research Fellow and Global Prosperity Lead at the Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation at Harvard Business School. With his colleagues Clay Christensen and Karen Dillon, Ifosa co-authored the book, The Prosperity Paradox. Ifosa's writings have been featured in the World Bank blogs, Harvard Business Review, Stanford Social in Innovation Review, and The Guardian. Ifosa will give a short presentation tonight on his book and recent research. And then I will engage Ifosa with a few questions, one or two, before opening it up to the audience for question and response. Following that, we'll have a few announcements and close the evening. So please join me in welcoming Ifosa Ojomo. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me uh, in the back? All right, just good, good. Um, oh, excellent. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I used to be a, a native of the Midwest. I lived in Wisconsin for six and a half years. Um, and there's a healthy rivalry between uh, the, the Packers and the Vikings. Um, I'm now based in Boston. I'm, I don't really watch football anymore. So, <laughs> um, but I'm really honored to be here, and I'm glad you all would spend your evening with me. Uh, if I may, uh, just to sort of set the stage, I would love to read a, a few paragraphs um, from our book. Uh, these are the paragraphs that end um, end uh, chapter 11 uh, of our book. And then I'll sort of go into the, uh, into the presentation. Um, and so bear with me uh, for a second. Um, we know that this is not a perfect book. Um, and some of you are like, well, then why am I here? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I, I'm kidding. Um, 
Um, we know that this is not a perfect book. Uh, we see it as the beginning, not the culmination of our work to more fully understand the role innovation can play in creating and sustaining prosperity for so many in, in our world. And we hope you will join us in that quest. You know, every good theory and every good idea is made better when we understand the things it can't explain and the circumstances in which it is most and least relevant. We invite you to challenge and refine our thinking to help us make the theories here stronger so that together we can get to the answers that matter most. Now, dream with us for a second. You know, the hearts of hundreds of millions of people across the world break whenever we see images of poor children who have no easy access to food, water, education, and basic health care. These images bring out the humanity in all of us. They connect us to people we do not know and whom we will likely never meet. But unless we can convert the strong emotions these images trigger into intelligent action, our efforts will amount to putting Band-Aids on a wound that never heals. And over time, we will develop compassion fatigue. These images of sick, poor children will no longer move us to action, only despair. Or worse, apathy. But we can solve this problem. It is possible. We are convinced, not because we are eternal optimists, but because we have done it before. The more we channel our collective passions into sustainable progress, the more we will chip away at the seemingly intractable problem of extreme poverty. We believe in the power of innovation. And more specifically, we believe that investing in market creating innovations, even when the circumstances seem challenging, provides one of the best chances for us to create prosperity in many of today's poor countries. This is the solution to the prosperity paradox and it can get us to the end of development in our lifetime. The stakes are too high for us not to get this right. Um, I think the, the I, I love doing that because it gives you an idea of uh, how we think about our work um, and our belief that uh, developing uh, what we call market creating innovations, which I'll explain here in a second, um, are uh, one of the best chances we have to help people uh, create prosperity um, all across the world. But at the same time, we don't believe it's the only way. Um, we believe that it's one solution in a portfolio of solutions that are out there. Um, and so we do invite people to, to challenge us, push us, stretch us, I'm expecting um, tough questions from you guys, and so get those questions ready. Um, I'd love to just start today by asking a couple of questions. And you guys are going to hear me talk for, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes or something. So let me, let me get, uh, get, give you guys a chance to, to, to um, engage a bit. Uh, by show of hands, if you were asked this question, um, I want to get a sense for uh, how many people would go with the answer A. Um, roughly how much did the Nigerian government spend per citizen in 2018? How many would, would say A? Okay, so that's not many, maybe 10, 8% of the room, 8%. Uh, B? We get a few more hands, I'd say maybe 20%. C? All right, all right. D? And E, okay, we've got maybe one for E. Okay, good. Um, and there are some of you that didn't vote. That's, that's not cool. <laughs> just, I just want to put it out there. Um, or, all right, now let me, let me ask another question, for the, especially for those people who didn't vote. This is your chance to vote. I mean, it's not like you're going to get graded, okay? Um, and some of you are out of school, so don't be scared. The options are the same. Um, how many would say A for the U.S.? Uh, okay, good. B? 
Nobody? Wow, you guys really think America's rich, huh? <laughs> All right, C. Ah, there we go. Excellent. D? All right. And who thinks America's really rich that they're E? OK. All right, so um, thank you. Thank you for indulging and participating. Um, it turns out that the Nigerian government spends uh, roughly $120 per citizen per year. Right. Uh, when you look at their budget for 2020, they're looking at spending uh, maybe 150 to 170. We'll see. Um, and then the U.S. government spends around $12,000. It's a simple calculation. Take the budget divided by how many people live there, and you get essentially the budget expenditure per person in the country. Um, the reason I love to share that is it gives you an idea of the financial constraints many governments in poor countries are under. And with those financial constraints comes managerial constraints, technical constraints, um, uh, political constraints, uh, many other issues, right? Because they don't generate and they don't have enough revenues to fix many of the problems that they have. And so while in theory, right, it would be amazing if the government of Nigeria spent uh, on infrastructure and created the best schools, uh, roads, healthcare systems, ports. When you actually look at the numbers, um, it's a tall order, right? It, near impossible for them to do that. And it puts into perspective our research and why we talk about the role innovation can play and the role specifically market creating innovations uh, can play in helping uh, countries uh, develop. I always love to show um, a, a slide of, of my professor, uh, Clay Christensen, <laughs> Uh, without whom I would not be standing here today. Uh, he's a professor at uh, HBS. Um, and the, the reason I show this is Clay um, has a way of attacking problems, uh, right? And so he is a big believer in leveraging uh, theories, and, and specifically management theories. Um, and he has changed the world of business. And so to put it into perspective, this is sort of how he sees the world. So every day we all wake up, especially if you're, well, I mean, not a, if you, we all wake up, right? <laughs> um, and if you're in, in, in the business field, uh, you don't have to be, but if you are, you have many questions that come up. Should I invest in this company? Uh, should we hire these people? Should we buy this company? Should we sell? Um, do we outsource? You have so many decisions you have to make. Um, and he believes that if you have good management theory, um, those decisions that you have to make would be a lot easier for you to make so that you get to the right outcome. And so he has spent his career developing a lot of the things you see in the second um, column there, which are just different management theories that he says you take um, and think of them as a, a tools in a toolbox. And depending on the question you have, right, you grab a theory, you apply it so that you divorce your opinions as much as you can from many of these management problems. You know, theories are often thought about as, um, things that are specific to just the, the hard sciences. Um, but he has developed a career in creating um, many management theories. And these have led to him writing um, 12 books, uh, the last of which was the, um, uh, the Prosperity Paradox. And so I'll share a few ideas uh, today from our book. And um, hopefully we can have good, uh, good conversation uh, afterwards. The first idea is just explaining how we think about the economy. Uh, the economy is often thought of as a hodgepodge of just a bunch of different things. Um, but looking at the economy through the lens of innovation, we think of the economy um, as 
uh, grouped t two distinct groups, uh, the consumption economy and the non-consumption economy. And I'll talk about that here in a second. The second is not all innovations are created equal, right? Um, my hope is that after today, when you walk out of here, um, you will begin to see the idea of innovation differently. You'll see that there are different types of innovations and they impact uh, a regional, national, and, and global, the global economy differently, uh, depending on what uh, people choose to invest in. Um, and the third is, is, is just uh, an initiative that we are beginning to think about at the uh, Christiansen Institute. Um, and so we'll, we'll jump right in, the first. This is a fairly simplistic um, image of how we see the economy. It's three eccentric circles. Um, and in the smallest circle, um, that's where you have the fewest number of people um, who have the most amount of resources. Right? And so think about any economy. You have the richest people, the people with the most access, the most skill, um, are the ones in the smallest circle. Most industries at the onset, um, the products that are developed are limited to the people in the smallest circles because they are the ones that have access to capital, have access to the skills to, um, to use and acquire, to acquire and use the products in the, in the industries. As the circle gets bigger, you get more people with progressively less wealth and less income, which then means they have less access. Now, it doesn't mean the people in the bigger circles don't need the things that the people have access to in the smaller circles. It just means they don't have access to them. Now, in those circles, we describe uh, many of the people there as non-consumers. These are people who would benefit from gaining access to many of the products that are accessible to people in the smallest circle, but uh, because of uh, skill, because of money, uh, because of the time it would take uh, to get access to the products, or simply because of availability, it's just not available in uh, my region, they can't access these products. So to sort of make it tangible, uh, think about the computing industry. So if you go back about 60, 70 years ago, computers were um, maybe as big as this room even. Um, highly technical machines, uh, they cost uh, millions of dollars. Um, you needed really skilled people to operate them. Uh, they were not, you know, they were not simple, simple, simple to, to, to use. Now, at the time, computers, mainframe uh, computers, were limited to the wealthiest sort of organizations, not even people, the wealthiest organizations, the biggest in, in society. And then innovations continued to come into the market and democratize uh, computing. And so you had mini computers that companies would sell for a couple hundred thousand dollars that created a new market. Then you had personal computers. Uh, cost goes down to a couple thousand dollars. And today we've got smartphones um, that you could buy for as little as $50. Uh, dollars. And the, the, these innovations have created entirely new markets for people who historically would never have been able to access the products on the market. In addition to the reduction in cost, notice that um, the skill necessary to use these computers um, also uh, got, got reduced. You don't need as much skill to, to use a smartphone. I mean, many of you who have kids or nieces, nieces, nephews, grandkids, you know, you know they, those little guys are, are good with the, uh, the iPads and, and, and iPhones, right? So you don't need as much skill to operate the, the machines. Now, this gives you an idea of how we think about the economy, non-consumption and consumption. Um, in order to target non-consumption, though, um, we need to think about innovation differently. And that's sort of where the second uh, idea that I'll spend most of my time on comes in. Um, so the folks who know Clay Christensen know him most for his work on disruptive innovation. 
And so if you actually get the chance to read uh, Steve Jobs' biography, it's written there that that was one of the only books Jobs read, uh, Clay's first book, The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, that talked about disruptive innovation. And so he, in Silicon Valley, uh, especially, he's sort of the innovation guru. But one of the words he hates the most is innovation, <laughs> because it's like innovations mean, innovation means so many different things to different people um, that we, we have to really uh, define it uh, so that people know what we're talking about when we use the term uh, innovation. So I'd love to just spend some time talking about that now. Um, so the way we think about innovation and the value of an innovation is in its ability to democratize access, right? Um, so if you think about the people in the, these circles as finite entities, yeah, um, your ability to democratize access to a product or a service increases the value of your innovation. So your ability to break through one of the circles into um, bigger and bigger uh, circles. But in order to do that, you need to develop an entirely new value network. A value network is just one of those uh, business, uh, you know, fancy business terms um, for the way, the way you add value to your product and get it from uh, essentially your manufacturing side to, to, to your customer, okay? Now, every innovation has a value network. This is sort of how to, how to think about it. So most innovations start with R&D. You sort of figure out what you want to make. Um, it's a simplistic representation of a value network, right? And then you do some manufacturing, and then you figure out how do I get it from point A to point B. You do distribution, and you, you convince people you got to make it. You market, sell, service, and so on. At each point, right, in this value network, you're adding value to the product but that's also increasing the cost, right? Um, and so for you to target an entirely new population of people, you can't leverage the same value network that has an established cost structure um, that's targeted at people in the smallest circle and use that same value network to target people in a larger circle. You have to create a new way um, to make the product to market the product, to sell the product, and to service the product. So you need an entirely new value network. And so this is sort of where you now start to see the difference in uh, price come in. Because the mainframe computers had an entirely different value network than the personal computers and the, the smartphones. Different way to make them, different salespeople, different service people, different people that use them, entirely different value networks. And I think one of the powers of targeting a larger uh, circle here with new markets is that because your innovation is targeted at a much larger population of people, you need more people to make the product, to market the product, to ser uh, sell the product, service the product, and so on. Same thing happened with cars. So many of us probably have access to cars if we don't actually have cars. But 120 years ago, cars were sort of like private jets today. Then an entrepreneur by the name of Henry Ford decided that he would make the car for the average, uh, average American. Cars cost about $10,000 back then, um, or roughly three to 400,000 today. Um, he was able to get the price down from $10,000 to roughly $260 in the 1920s. So about $35,000 or $4,000 in, in today's dollars. He had to create an entirely new value network um, in order to democratize access to cars. Now that type of innovation um, we call market creating innovations. Um, and so Talk about the three types of innovations here. Innovations that create new markets so that a population of people who historically did not have access to a product are called market-creating innovations. 
Now at the core of many uh, societies, these innovations create the foundation for growth and development to happen. But I think what's, in, what's most interesting for us about these innovations is that they create jobs and they begin to change sort of the cultural dynamics um, and institutions and behaviors of people in society. And so before Henry Ford, for instance, created the car, um, we didn't have as many roads in the US, certainly not drivable roads. Um, we didn't really have a need for Department of Transportation. Um, and so you begin to see how innovation connects with infrastructures, um, institutions, and creates new ways and new behaviors of people in society. But these innovations need capital, right? Because you're creating an entirely new value network. You can't make cars the same way um, to serve the mass market that you were making them when they cost $10,000 and when they served a very small select number of people. Um, so these are the, uh, the first types. The second types are what we call sustaining innovations. Now these are innovations that make good products better. Um, and so if we sort of stick with the example of, of, of cars, um, you know, you get a new car that has new features in it, right? It's got uh, heated seats, uh, adaptive cruise control, and all these new features. Now those are exciting features, they're nice, but you as a, as a company don't need to create an entirely new value network um, to make those cars and to, to service people um, who, who, who are your uh, existing customers. Because sustaining innovations target people in an existing circle. They target people who can already afford the existing products. They create little uh, net growth but they can improve margins uh, for a company. Um, they improve market, f market share as well, right? And so you think about a lot of competition, you look at what the competition is doing, you're trying to win customers, uh, trying to gain market share. So when you add more features to your products, give different options, these are uh, typically what we call sustaining innovations. The last type of innovations are what we call efficiency innovations. Efficiency innovations make good products cheaper. Um, but at the core of these types of innovations is um, they tend to eliminate jobs. And so when a company invests in automation um, to improve efficiencies or they outsource uh, to uh, a part of their operations to other regions to take advantage of either tax benefits or, or wage lower wages, these are efficiency innovations. Uh, it's important to know no innovation in and of itself is bad. Um, I think what we try to do um, in explaining the different types is just show they have different impacts on uh, an organization and, and an economy. And so with efficiency innovations, they free up cash flows because you're doing things a lot more efficiently, but you're still serving the same customers that you were serving historically. Um, so if you're serving those same customers, you're doing things more efficiently, you can actually get more cash flows back into the company, increase, uh, improve your profitability. You decide to give the money uh, either back to shareholders or you, you know, do, do whatever you want with it. But if you funnel those funds to invest in market creating innovation, then you have this beautiful cycle, right? Where you create a new market, you improve the product, develop efficiencies and you uh, sort of continue that cycle over and over again. But there are diff diff different characteristics of these types of innovations, right? Market creating innovations re require capital. Again, because you have to build a new value network, they typically take a bit longer to pay back and the market does not yet exist, right? I think that's perhaps one of the most um, interesting things about market creating innovations. The markets typically don't exist yet. So you have to convince investors that you can actually create the new market. Sustaining and efficiency innovations are different. The markets typically exist. There's not a ton of convincing going on. Your internal processes in your organizations are often aligned 
uh, with investing in improving the product um, or uh, Im improving uh, efficiencies, right? So that you can reduce uh, your uh, cost. And so that sort of gives you an idea of the types of innovations um, that we talk about in the book. Now we want to think about how those innovations impact development. And so I'll need some participation. This is perhaps one of my favorite slides. Um, there's some demographics here that I'll, I'll spew out. Um, it's a country where 70% of people live in rural areas. One in five kids dies before the fifth birthday. 10% um, electrification. Uh, the average household spends over half their income on food. Um, not many people go to secondary school. It's about 10 to 20% penetration. And life expectancy is very low, 45 years, which means I'd be in my highlight years now if I lived there. Um, what, what countries come to mind when you sort of hear demographics like that? You can just shout out a country. Mm. Nigeria is a good one. Haiti, Haiti is, is, is an excellent one, actually. Let me get two more. Yemen. Yemen. OK, good. Especially, especially with what's been going on over the last decade in, in, the, in the country. One more. Cambodia. Cambodia. OK, I've never heard Cambodia before, actually. I, I usually get countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, you'd be happy to know that this is, uh, these demographics belong to the United States of America. Mm. Before, you, before you walk out of here and say this guy is crazy, um, <laughs> clearly not America today, right? Thank God we, we, we weren't born into this America. This, these are demographics that belong to America 100 to 150 years ago. And the question we asked as we wrote this book was um, how did America go from here, dem these kinds of demographics to the demographics it has today? What was the state of America's institutions 100 to um, 150 years ago? What was the state of corruption in America's politics, like overt corruption? Um, what was the state of America's infrastructures? Um, and as we studied this, we, began, we, we just found that Development is not linear. Um, what we learned is that market creating innovators, such as um, Isaac Singer, who figured out a, a way to get the sewing machine to go from uh, enabling people sew a shirt uh, in 14 hours to one hour, um, he figured out how, how to democratize access. So it wasn't only about uh, making the sewing machine more uh, efficient. It was about making sure people who could never have dreamt of owning one were able to buy one, were able to set up small businesses, and were able to create jobs for people. So he democratized access. His focus was on creating a new market for people who didn't have access. And this led to tens of thousands of jobs. This created and spurred new industries to emerge. And as these new industries began to emerge, you began to see this interesting evolution of development happen in the United States. You began to see workers come together and organize so that they could demand more, not just from the people who employed them, but from governments as well. And so while Isaac Singer was not necessarily thinking about developing the US as he was making the sewing machine um, more affordable and accessible, he inadvertently uh, did. I've talked about Henry Ford and how he decided to democratize access to cars. Now, before his innovation, um, which wasn't just in making cars, um, before his innovation, cars were custom made, right? And so they were custom made, they were very expensive, but he figured out a way to make the car really inexpensively. And he's known for the assembly line, but there were many other things he had to do to get the car from a Henry Ford plant in, in, in Michigan to the average customer. He had to invest in steel mills, iron ore mines. 
He had to invest in glass factories, paint factories, rubber fa uh, plantations. Um, he had to invest in uh, railroads. He actually built gas stations, right? Because think about it. You can have a car. It's sort of the problem we're having with electric cars today, right? You could buy one, but where do you charge it? So he had to invest in all these things. And as people now had access to cars, they were now able to live outside of the centers of cities. And so it led to the emergence of suburbs. Governments were now able to tax people who bought cars, um, tax gasoline, and tax uh, rubber for the tires, so they could now invest in roads. And so as we make our cars a lot more um, fuel efficient, you're actually seeing how governments are having less and less money to invest in America's road infrastructure because um, the way we typically fund major road infrastructures is, is gasoline taxes and, and rubber um, for the tires. And so it's an interesting dynamics. But, but you see the connection between um, innovation and infrastructure um, and taxes that go to governments to help them um, deliver services uh, better. Now, I know it's, it's hard to sort of think about these innovations uh, in the context of many of today's poor countries. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's sort of hard to think of an, an America that's really poor, right? Like, it's, it's really hard. And there are places in America you could go to, but by and large, this is the richest country in the world. It's a country where you come uh, for opportunity. And so I'd love to just share a couple of quick examples to, to, to illustrate that this is possible, even in some of the poorest countries in the world. Um, now, anybody here familiar with Indomie noodles? We got a few people, okay. Um, so I grew up eating Indomie noodles. I love them. Um, they're sort of like ramen noodles, but they taste better. Um, so the people who have had both can agree. I see a nod. All right, yeah, uh, excellent. Um, so, 1988, these two brothers decide that um, they want to figure out a way to sell instant noodles to the average Nigerian. Now, you got to understand, 1988, um, we did not have access to the kinds of communication technologies we have today. Uh, most of the continent of Africa did not have uh, phones. Um, Nigeria specifically was a country that uh, was a lot poorer than it is today um, under a military regime. So all those demographics do not, they, they don't scream, come invest in Nigeria, and more so come invest um, in, in creating a market that sells to the average Nigerian a food that we have no idea what it is. In fact, when it was first introduced, many Nigerians thought noodles were worms. No joke. Um, you might laugh, but if you've never seen noodles, you probably think they were worms too. I mean, they do look wormy. Um, <laughs> um, but these guys, um, they saw something else. They saw the country was rapidly urbanizing. People did not have as much time for food as they used to, um, to prepare food. And then they said, let's figure out a, um, a, a way to make these things flavorful, uh, really easy to cook. Um, so that people don't have to spend as much time. And so they learned, they figured it out. And just to put it into perspective, over the past 30 or so years, in order to get a pack of noodles from the farm, really, you think about wheat, uh, palm oil, to someone's home, these are, these are the things that they have had to invest in and things that have been pulled into the Nigerian economy. So you go from a country that the average person thought noodles were worms to a country where there are now 16 other uh, companies making noodles. Um, a country where, that has attracted uh, close to half a billion dollars of uh, investment uh, to create this noodle market. Uh, manufacturing plants, tens of thousands of jobs that have been enabled, right? And this is sort of a 20 cent pack of noodles. And you can begin to think about the kind of impact it would have if we had um, other products that were democratized. Similar thing happened with mobile phones. 
This is a story that is sort of more well known. If you've ever traveled to uh, any, any, really any, any low income country, the one thing you can be sure of is you'll be able to get access to a, a mobile telecommunication service. But 20 years ago um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the idea of setting up a, a mobile phone company was laughable. When Mo Ibrahim went to friends and said, you know, I'm going to make this thing affordable and accessible, many of his friends thought he had lost his mind. They said, that's Africa. That's it's AIDS, that's poverty, it's corruption. There's no way this could ever work. Um, but again, if we think about those three circles, he focused on creating a new market, creating a new value network uh, for people who, in their wildest dreams, would never have access uh, to cell phones. In so doing, he was able to, in a short time, actually, seven years, uh, create a company that um, served over 5 million uh, customers, uh, hired over 5,000 people, um, and he eventually sold it for uh, $3.4 billion in seven years. Um, when we were writing the book, we were interviewing uh, Mo from his uh, yacht in Monaco. How many of you have a yacht in Monaco? <laughs> I don't either. Um, but that's exciting, and it's exciting for Mo, and he's made a lot of money. But I think for me, again, similar to the noodle story, I think about all the things that this pulls into the economy. So when other investors saw that it was possible to create um, a thriving mobile telecommunications uh, company, they flooded in with billions of dollars of investments. And now there are over 100 companies um, creating close to 4 million jobs, creating tax revenues in the billions of dollars that go back to governments. Now, I want to be clear that you know, one pack of noodles or a company that makes noodles or, or, or mobile phones is not what is going to create development in the world, right? But the process by which we democratize innovations and create new markets for people, uh, the process by which we make products simple and affordable um, has a lot of potential um, to, to improve the lives of, of billions of people uh, across the world. You know, I was in Nigeria a few weeks ago, um, and I got the chance to see some companies doing this. And it got me really excited about the prospect of not just the country, but the continent. Um, so uh, Kobo 360 is a company that's really trying to improve the distribution and logistics space. Um, the company just raised $30 million in their Series A round with Goldman Sachs as a lead investor. Um, Max.ng is in the transportation uh, space, um, trying to improve short uh, sort of logistics and, and mobility for people. Um, the Series A raised $9 million um, and are, again, democratizing access. MicroInsure is another one um, that, you know, the founder looked at the insurance landscape. Um, and when you look at the, the whole continent of Africa, with 15 or so percent of the global population, and it's set to keep going up, uh, it, it is it accounts for less than 2% of the, ins the global insurance market. Yet, the people in the, on, on the continent are most prone to, are the ones most prone to accidents, but they do not have any um, access to insurance. So he created an insurance product uh, that now uh, serves over 60 million people. And it's an entirely different uh, value network he has created. Um, and we talk about that, um, him specifically, and his company in, in the book as well. So it requires a different way to think about the problems. Uh, but I think the pattern that we saw was clear is figuring out ways to democratize access uh, to, uh, to different uh, people. I'll ask one last question um, before I, I sort of round up. Uh, you know, globally, what percentage of people earn more than uh, $7,500 annually? I, I should have put annually. Um, 9%? OK, a couple, three, three, four people. 16%? OK. 
27? All right, 33. And who are the optimists in this room? 49. All right, one, excellent. So I, hope, I wish it were 49. It's, uh, it's about 16%. Pew Research Center did a survey, um, and about 16, 18% earn uh, annually uh, more than $7,500, right? Um, I think that puts into perspective how most of the world lives. If you look at those three circles I drew, it's a simplistic representation of the economy, right? Now, either local or national or global, you begin to see how small the, the smallest circle really is. You begin to see how lucky and blessed we are to live here. Um, and I think the question uh, we should be asking ourselves is, how do we, with the resources we have, whether it's money, access, networks, how do we think about creating new value networks that can help democratize innovations for the 84% of people uh, in, in the world who earn $7,500 or less? Um, because if we, if we don't do that, if we don't begin to think differently about this, um, I don't know how we make progress. Um, we're thinking about this at the Institute, working on uh, what we're calling the Market Creating Innovation Lab, um, really trying to um, help entrepreneurs uh, with the skills and resources necessary to identify, cultivate, and scale market creating innovations. Uh, I think at the core of our thinking is a quote by Henry Ford, and I'll, I'll end with this, uh, where he says, the highest use of capital is not to make more money, uh, but to make money do more for the betterment of, of, uh, of life. And I think by democratizing access, um, whether it's healthcare, whether it's um, education, whether it's mobility, uh, housing, by helping people get access to the things they can't that will help them lead more productive lives, uh, we can actually, uh, I believe, get to the end of development in our lifetime. So I want to thank you guys for your attention and participation. Um, it's been my honor to talk to you today. Thank you. We'll move to uh, Q&A here in a moment, um, but before we do, I'm just gonna start us off with a, a question of my own. So, Ifosa, in your book, you talk about how market-creating innovations can generate an environment that uh, results in stronger, more accountable, transparent institutions, develop uh, and improve national infrastructure, and reduce corruption. That seems pretty counterintuitive. Don't, don't we have to first address corruption, build infrastructure, and then we can do these market creating innovations? How does that work? So just a, a little plug, I, uh, I gave a TED talk in June and it just came out. So um, just Google my name and, and uh, corruption TED talk. To get, my, get, my, get my views up, get my views up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, half, I'm half kidding, I'm half kidding. But, but really, watch the talk. Um, okay. Ha hashtag corruption, hashtag Ufosa, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, right? Now, I, I, left, uh, I left Nigeria 20 years ago with a one-way, 19 years ago, almost 20, one-way ticket to America because, um, I mean, I was never going to go back um, because I felt there was just no way we could ever develop. Like, to Kyle's question, we... I mean, there's so many things we had to do. We had to build the institutions, root out corruption, invest in infrastructure. How the heck are we gonna do it? When you look at the landscape of things, you're like, it's impossible. Um, because the narrative, sort of the paradigm that I understood with regards to how development happened was, innovation was something that happened after a society fixed itself which is after a society built out its infrastructures, fixed its governments, and rooted out um, all signs of corruption. But as we were researching this book, we found out that that's not really how it happens. Innovation is the process by which society actually develops and fixes, fixes itself. Um, so if you take 
transportation as a very simple example, right? We think about all the institutions we have in the US um, that support the transportation sector. Getting your driver's license, getting your car registered, getting some kind of insurance. Um, how do those institutions exist before the innovation of the car comes, right? It's the innovation that leads to the institutions. And it's an evolutionary process that happens, right? It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and so we, we wrote specifically, because of, of that question, we wrote a section of the book we call the barrier section. Um, chapter eight talks about the, the, the relationship between innovation and institutions. Chapter nine talks about corruption and chapter 10 talks about infrastructure. And what we try to do is present um, to, to readers a way to frame the relationship between innovation and these things. And so I think um, as long as you're focused on creating new markets that can serve more and more people in society, uh, those new markets you create typically lead to right, the development of these institutions and provide the funding to governments. I remember how we started this talk. The Nigerian government has $135 to $150 per year per Nigerian, of which about 35 or 50 um, around there goes towards uh, service in existing debt. So really, it has about $100. So whoever said 100 was, was more correct. There is no way the, the country's government is building its institutions or infrastructure with $100 a year. It's just not possible, right? So I think understanding those things and then understanding really the evolutionary process of development as it happens and how it relates to innovation is really what we were trying to expose in the book. But now, uh, wouldn't corrupt, you know, corrupt officials, elites, aren't they just going to get more money now to continue to maintain the status quo? How do you, how do you reconcile that? Um, well, in the short term, perhaps. But I think um, the, the way, the, way the, the, the better way to think about it, I think, is, um, I mean, America was once exceedingly corrupt, um, a lot more corrupt than it is today. Because whenever I say that, people say, well, America is still corrupt. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a very different kind of corruption. You're blessed and lucky and to be living in this America, right? If you, if you want to see a corrupt country, there, there are many others out there. Um, but there was a time where corruption in this country resembled corruption in many poor countries. And so we, in the corruption chapter, tried to um, really categorize corruption in a way that said, um, this is a different type of corruption that goes on here versus in really poor countries. And what we describe is that whenever you're able to create a new market that generates taxes for governments, right, so they can have more resources to do their jobs, you're right. Some government officials will pocket some of that money, but the monies will go to, typically go to building better institutions and infrastructures, right, for people in the region. Um, and as you increase the tax base, right, as more people pay taxes and become more politically active, they begin to demand more from government. Now, it does not happen overnight. I think that's, that's the other thing I'd love to be very clear about. It does not happen overnight. It's an evolutionary process. But as people become more prosperous and more empowered, they pay more taxes to the government. And there becomes this symbiotic relationship that uh, begins to emerge. And then governments now begin to act better over time. right? And so, just understanding that process, I think, is important. Um, now, in the short term, in our lifetime, um, Nigeria is probably not going to become top five country in Transparency's Interna International uh, Corruption Perception Index. Um, but can we see Nigeria become less corrupt as new markets are created, as more citizens are paying taxes, as we're investing more in education, I think that's more possible. 
Thanks, Ifosa. Let's open it up for uh, question and response. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and Kate will find you with a mic. Uh, just a few ground rules for questions. Please keep them brief. Please keep them respectful. And please keep them in the form of a question. Hi, so I have a question. Um, so I know, I mean, I agree with everything that you're saying, but a huge issue is that a lot of well-intended nonprofits will go into developing countries and give away free material goods. And what that does, in essence, is it circumvents the perspective of generating this virtuous economic cycle that you're talking about. That's right. So the question is, how do you mitigate that? Because it seems, in a way, that, that those well-intentioned intentions um, almost create an extra barrier to what you're talking about. Amen. What's your name? Sasha. <laughs> Sasha. Thank you, Sasha. Now, I, I, I didn't confess. Um, I was one of those NGO guys. Um, no, no, really. When I began to get into this um, business, if you will, um, I, I, I left Nigeria. I, I studied as an engineer. I got a job. Life was good. I began <laughs> reading books. Um, and when the, the, the scale of poverty hit me, the first thing I thought about was go build a nonprofit and help people, right? Because it tugs at your heart. It brings, like I say, it brings out the humanity in you. Um, and so we built wells, we funded some school projects, and I mean, free. Um, but I could not see the, the impact and the change uh, happen. The good thing, um, I will say, um, so anyway, I'm confessing that I was a part of that, um, and my story is actually detailed in, in the book um, as, a, as what not to do, so uh, there we go. Um, and so there are two, two ways I would respond to your question. One is, um, you know, buy the book and give to all your friends who are, um, <laughs> are doing that, um, being facetious. But um, the second is, when you actually look at that industry, the aid industry, per capita. Um, so essentially, if you take how much aid is given to a country, divided by how many people live in that country, it's a very small number. Um, and many of these aid projects are um, regionally focused, and they are very specific in what they do. Um, it does not mean it does not create a barrier, uh, but it doesn't create as big a barrier. And so if you decided today you wanted to go into Ghana to improve the cocoa industry, um, to add some value to cocoa, to make chocolates, um, you could do that. Um, now, there may be some NGOs providing free services here and there, but by and large, that industry um, has not yet crowded out uh, innovation. Um, and so for numbers, it's sub $100 per capita if you look at how much aid money goes into countries per, um, per citizen. It's, it's not that much. Hi, um, I'm Michelle, and I was wondering, Michelle. who do you think are going to be the leaders of the innovation that you're talking about, innovation to better um, life? Is it going to be kids that are using the iPads and iPhones? Is it going to be college students, or is it going to be people like you? OK. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, 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 who are people? People like me are. Uh, are they okay? People? Are they all right? <laughs> no, I, I, I. I uh, so I, I kid, but it's a, it's actually a very important question, um, because, you know, one thing I, I, I said this, and and it was sort of a throwaway comment. You know, market creating innovations require capital. Um, when you have a country that's spending $100 per citizen, some are sp spending way less than that. Somalia spends less than $30 per citizen. Um, the capital um, and what comes with it right, has to come from somewhere. Um, and so to, to your question, um, the, the ecosystems, uh, because that's more than just the people, 
the ecosystems that will um, create these new markets, fund the democratization of these innovations, um, have to be connected to the global economy in some way. Um, and so in a way, they, they have to be people like me, um, people who are connected to global talent, to global capital, um, can attract capital from the West, from the East, from India, from, from everywhere. So in a way, they, they sort of have to be. Now in terms of the practitioners or the, the managers on the ground, they don't necessarily have to be uh, like me or, or at least stay um, like me. Um, and to put this into perspective, if you, when, when you actually track development of um, many of today's prosperous countries, when they were poor, America, for instance, or um, Japan, South Korea, uh, they were very good at attracting foreign direct investment and um, you could say foreign talent investment, right? Um, and so the FDI foreign direct investment would come in, talent would come in, train local folks, they would develop sort of new systems, new ways to do things, and then they would then improve. Um, and so no country has really ever developed in isolation. We've all developed um, with help from one another. Um, and so it's actually a good question. It would, it would, it's incumbent on folks who have access um, to think differently about how they can now democratize uh, uh, access. Thank you so much, Foza. Um, just a brief question. I was curious as kind of the two bits you would add, a little bit of the piggy, uh, <clears throat> piggyback on that question over there, but the argument between like Jeffrey Sachs, for instance, the 7%, he's very staunch about still to this day that should go to aid versus more of the William Easterly argument of that aid is creating this cyclical cycle of dependence. I think recently that argument has uh, shifted over to the NGOs where some of these international NGOs are starting to add um, uh, commercialization value um, added earning um, to their model. So I was just curious what your kind of two cents on that argument is and more particularly how it affects kind of innovation of those maybe dependency causing NGOs. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a complicated question, right? And I think we, we, we often try to simplify these things and you know, are you in the Sachs camp or the Easterly camp? Um, and it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. If I had to pick a camp, like you put a gun to my head, what camp am I in? I'm gonna pick the Easterly camp, right? Um, but I will say, um, behind every, just, to, just to, to, to support the Easterly argument, behind every NGO, uh, every, every major foundation, um, every major development institution is an entity that has created profitable enterprises. And so when you look at the biggest shareholders for the World Bank, America, it's the richest countries in the world. When you look at the biggest foundations in the world, the Gates Foundation, Rockefeller, you've got Microsoft, you've got Standard Oil, Ford Foundation, right? And so you can't get around market-based enterprises, development, you, you can't get around that. Now I think where Sachs comes into the picture is, okay, if we look at the world as it is today, it's not, it's not that easy for a poor country to get a leg up, especially when you have a lot of neoliberal policies that say you have to sort of open your market, trade freely. Like how the heck is Nigeria where productivity is almost negative, gonna trade at the same level as the US. It's impossible, right? You're gonna eat our lunch every day. And when you look at, again, is a book by um, Ha Jun Chang uh, called Kicking Away the Ladder, um, and another one, Bad Samaritans, where he says, look, when America was coming up, it erected tariffs so that it could protect its infant industries, so they developed and then they could be competitive. Japan did the same thing, South Korea, um, China. And so it's, I think with, with Sachs, you, you, you would then say, okay, maybe increase your aid because the playing field is not fair, um, so you could sort of level it a bit, but 
If I had to pick a camp, I would say focus on how you could attract capital, talent, create markets, develop your skills, become productive, and then you can now be sort of a global player. Um, so I, I'd pick the, the, the Easterly camp. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for my, uh, very much. Um, my question has to do with uh, the previous two questions. Um, um, so I read this book about uh, Dead Aid by Nambisa Moyo mm. a couple of years back, and uh, just listening to your uh, remarks here tonight, um, would you say that um, you know, stopping any kind of aid to development countries, whether it's in Africa or Asia or anywhere else, would be the better way to develop those countries? Um, um, and also the question that Sasha was asking about, yeah. Man, so again, that is, um, that's, that's, a, that's a hard one because it's, um, it simplifies a complex problem. Um, Here's, here's the thing with, with Dead Aid. Uh, it's a book by Dambisa Moyo. She's, uh, I believe, Zambian, a Zambian economist uh, trained, uh, I think, at Oxford. Um, wrote the book Dead Aid, very brilliant. It, it, it criticizes the aid industry and, and says, look, the aid you give uh, primarily to governments, right? Because a lot of foreign aid goes to governments, um, actually props up and empowers these governments. Um, and so the dynamics between governments and the people doesn't change. If anything, it gets worse. Um, so if you think about it, the reason governments listen to us, um, it's not because they really, really, really care about us. It's because on some level, they're accountable to us. We pay taxes, right? And the taxes fund their salaries. And the more influential you are in society, the more access to governments you have. I mean, if I donated a million dollars to, um, is you guys uh, Klobuchar? Is that your senator? Yeah. Isn't she running for president? Yeah. Oh, All right, well, she's not gonna win, so you get, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding, cut that, cut, don't, don't cut that. I, um, anyways, if I donated a million dollars to her, I'm pretty sure I could get a meeting to, to with her, right? And so, um, societies where you've got these markets that create wealth and prosperity, that pay taxes, fund the government, have figured out this symbiotic relationship with governments and people. And so the governments and people are somewhat on an equal footing. Not quite equal, but they're more equal. Now when an aid organization goes to a poor country where there is already an imbalance of power, right? There's an imbalance of power, and then you prop up the government in the hopes that the government spends the money to help the poor, um, she's explaining that, man, that doesn't, that doesn't really help. Instead, what you need to do is empower the people um, so that they can actually become more prosperous and they're, they're both closer to sort of equal footing, right? Um, so that's, that's why she says aid doesn't work. Um, so I get that argument. I, I don't know that the solution would be to just completely cut off aid. Because if you do that, um, it doesn't change the dynamics in these countries. Um, Nigeria has a ton of oil. If you cut off aid, the government will just exploit oil resources and the dynamics between the government and the people is not gonna change, right? South Africa's got diamonds. Gold and so the key has to be how do we channel the the, the capital um, to to help people create markets so that we can further we can better equalize um, sort of the stance with the existing governments. Um, so it's not a yeah cut off aid no don't cut it off it's more nuanced I think. Um, hi, my name is Emily. Um, when I'm thinking about the idea of democratization of innovation, um, it also reminds me of the thing that tends to come along with major innovations, which is um, negative externalities in a lot of cases. And so, That's right. um, and the um, 
the spreading of negative externalities. And the obvious example that comes to mind is the automobile and um, the increasing rates of um, carbon emissions from transportation. What are your thoughts on how the market addresses those negative externalities? I'm, I'm thinking about the cyclical cycle that you um, had on your slide. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like markets tend to innovate past negative externalities? And what's the relationship between um, yeah, um, yeah. market innovations and other institutions such as governments to deal with these externalities? Yeah, if, if, we, if we think of this, of development, as something that happens in a spectrum, a continuum, you would have uh, perhaps the Scandinavian countries at sort of this, the high end. Um, and if you look at how they are trying to take care of their environments, um, you can see a ton of innovation going on in Norway, Sweden, and so on. Because those interventions cost a lot of money. When your government is spending thirty to $35,000 per year per citizen, you can afford to do that. When your government is spending one hundred and fifty, dollars it's incredibly difficult to not just legislate, um, but it's also difficult to enforce. And so in theory, I think it's, it's the government's job to make sure markets don't run amok. Like, I mean, the government has a big role to play. What we have to be realistic about is their capacity to play that role. And so I'd be hard, like, it'd be tough for me to ask a government that can't pay salaries to teachers to go figure out how to like, figure out the environment thing. You know, so it's, 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 it has to happen in, in sequence, I think. Um, and I think there are innovations that could help mitigate, um, uh, especially the climate issues. But for now, we got to figure out how to pay teachers before we, we figure out other things. If I was to thank you, oh. this is very stimulating. I, I'm curious on the comments that were made here about the aid and the difficulties with it. Would it, what, what's your take on doing something that would approach aid in more of a grant request and an accountability, a grant request, similar to the way grants are made in this country by both governmental agencies and by foundations? Um, the the organization seeking the grant says, here's what we're going to do with it, and then has to provide some accountability as to how it's been spent to achieve that in order to see if the grant is going to then be continued or replicated. Yeah, no, sir, that, that's, I think that's a, that's a brilliant question. There's a, a paper we reference in uh, Chapter 8, uh, uh, funded by the World Bank, actually, uh, titled, how not, to f how Not to Fix Problems That Matter. Um, it's, it's written by uh, Kate Bridges and Michael Wilcox. And, and, and what the paper essentially tries to explain is that, um, by and large, many development programs are um, they're grant-based in the sense that you propose something, or the, it, it doesn't quite matter where the uh, initiation starts, but there's an initiative, right? We want to improve. Uh, the primary health care system in this country. They find uh, players in the country that can help, and they develop a proposal, and it goes to the powers that be at the World Bank, the Africa Development Bank, at these major institutions. And you sort of figure out um, goals and benchmarks, and you sign off, right? So there are, uh, there are checks and balances. What happens, though, is many of these programs, um, it's it's getting, it's easier, it's easy to game the system. And so um, what the paper talks about is now, especially in terms of institutional reform, which is now this sort of big uh, industry that has come up, is let's change or fix the institutions. It says most institutional reform programs fail, um, and the ones that do succeed, succeed in creating institutions that look like successful institutions in rich countries. And so there are ways to write a grant and um, give status reports that say, hey, 
look at how we're making people fill out these forms and change this thing, but it doesn't fundamentally change the practices of the country. I think largely because the institutions are divorced from the way people wake up every day and figure out how to make progress in their lives, all right? And so, but, but there, are, there are now ways that people sort of game uh, the system, which I think is why a ton of money keeps going in. You do projects, but it doesn't quite move the needle as much. One big example is education. There's a big push to get kids educated, primary school, secondary school. And they found out, oh wow, we've now got primary school education levels on par in, in many poor countries, on par with um, many wealthy nations, high income countries. However, kids are going to school, but they're not learning anything. And so you've built a school, you're paying teachers, um, and you look at the World Bank numbers and on the website, they're up and to the right. But what are kids learning? Um, how are kids becoming more productive in society? Nothing, right? And so it's, it's a complex problem, um, which, which I, I, unfortunately, I, I don't have a, a, a good answer for, <laughs> besides, uh, I sound like a one-hit wonder, uh, market creating innovations, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all I got, man. It's like, hey, what are we eating for dinner? Market creating innovations. Like, where, where, how am I flying out of here to market creating innovations? No, I'm kidding. All right. OK, <clears throat> thank you. Um, we've kind of talked about the idea of uh, corruption, but uh, I was thinking more in the lines of um, how most of these developing areas are heavily politicized, and you have your marketing, market creating uh, innovations, and you want to make an imprint. But we've already talked of how capital in intensive is, and most of the time you have to get foreign direct uh, investment. Uh, so most people would end up having to resort to, first of all, get into the politics side of things before in, uh, you know putting forth what you uh, you want to put in terms of your innovation. So. Uh, would you think that that's a good way of circumventing that challenge, um, or there would be other alternatives? Politics is uh, it's a it's a very uh, it's a very intense sport, um, and if you're not heavily resourced, um, I don't typically encourage politics, especially politics in poor countries. Uh, because there is an existing way the system works. Um, and to go in and make a big splash, um, you, you, have to, you, have to, you have to be heavily resourced. And not just financially, but so your social capital has to be strong, um, integrity, like people have to know you. Um, because going in at a fairly lower level um, without a lot of resources, it, it makes it incredibly difficult. Well, I'm afraid that uh, we're out of time, but uh, please join me in thanking IFOSA.